that's okay. I will understand you. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So thanks for inviting me, and I think this is sort of the South Asia Institute and the Law Environment and Development Center at SOAS who has invited me. So I'm, thanks for for that. Uh, okay. So I've thought about. Uh, let me just situate this thing a little bit in the context of. of uh, the part of India known as Northeast India, and this is, we were just talking about that earlier, but one of the problems when you talk about Northeast is that we usually, uh, and also it's sort of tricky when you have a mixed audience with people who are from the place or worked on the place for a long time and people who are perhaps familiar with South Asia but not, not the region itself. So a lot of time you end up explaining a lot of the background. You, know, you, it's, so you hardly come to the topic because there's so much context I mean, things like the inner line permits, the sixth schedule. I mean, these are, these are a lot of things that are very critical to understand sort of the colonial or the post colonial uh, context of, of Northeast India. And, and as I said, you know, it's like, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of times people who are familiar with the South Asian context but not the Northeast, uh, there is often a lot of uh, misunderstandings. And say, for example, with the, with the Citizen Amendment Act, there's been of course, a lot of debate about that. And I think uh, for a lot of people in India, uh, sort of the mainland India, it's been an issue of, of this is new legislation that's sort of perceived as anti-Muslim. But in the Northeastern case, there are other things as well uh, that are, uh, people are reacting to. Yeah. So I think I, I kind of see in my own Oh, I have a few slides here that already... So this is the map, just to situate the place. <laughs> but, uh, so I've sort of situated my own work as sort of building up what we call sort of Northeastern studies, Northeastern Indian studies, sort of establishing that as a feeler in its own right. And, uh, and one of the, I mean, one of the, the scholars that's been, been very important in this field is, is Professor Sanyi Barua, who's a political scientist at, at Bard College in the US. And he sort of has a, a series of three books that's been extremely influential in sort of establishing this field. Uh, and uh, I just mentioned this book, his, his most recent one, in the name of the nation, India and its Northeast. And, um, this is a book that is, I think, is extremely important and, and, and a very good read that I really would like to recommend. And, and Sandy, this was a, a friend of mine, and I will come back to, I mean, we have had a discussion for, for now more than 20 years, I think, and we have a few disagreements that I, I will bring up because I think these disagreements are not only sort of, of a personal nature, but I do think they are, are pointing to something that is larger than that sort of... Uh, but there are also, I mean, so I'm, I'm mentioning Sanya, but I think what happened, I mean, there used, used to be this sort of uh, general argument saying that there are no studies on the Northeast. Uh, I think this is, used to be right up until, I say, the last 10, 15 years. Now there is a range of new scholarship coming up and by a lot of young people who are working, I mean, from the region or also from outside the region. But there is, and I think this has also been possible through opening up of the area. Before it was very difficult to get research is permissions to work there, but now I mean there's a lot of people working there and it's really a new sort of generation of scholarship coming up where you have very empirically grounded work but also very theoretically edgy uh, stuff that is coming out, which I, I find is, is it's really great to be part of that. I mean a lot of new gen conversations going on which I, which I find very uh, uh, important. And I've been uh, uh, privileged to work with, with Dolly Keekon, who is a Naga scholar, uh, now based at Melbourne University. And we have this new book that came out recently on migration from the region, uh, but I'm not talking about that today. <laughs> I'm perhaps touching on it a little bit. But uh, Dolly has also, uh, so this is the Living the Land, it's a co-authored book. And, and uh, Dolly has also just recently released her which is based on her PhD work, which is dealing with sort of uh, oil and coal, which is the, the topic for today. <coughs> yes, so I'm sort of thinking a little bit now about the whole controversy about coal in Northeast India. 
And I think it's, it's interesting, again, when we think about coal uh, in the context of North East, it's sort of a different story than the, the normal stories that we, we are engaging with. And I, I have these slides because this is a group of friends from Norway and, and other places who are working on a new project where they were talking about India's new coal geography. Uh, and this is a geography that is, is based along the coastlines. Uh, and it's uh, mainly based on imported coal from South Africa and, and other places, where they are you know, building new harbors, they're building new power grids, and also new power plants. And this is a, 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 a quite recent development, which, again, you know, with all this huge investment in this new infrastructure, sort of it, 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 it speaks to the fact that this will be a lasting thing. You know, this will not coal will have a long life still in in India, and this also sort of uh, connects to the sort of the, the older geography of coal, which is one that it, when you have mainly in the east and east India and also other parts uh, where you have sort of the state. Yeah, the new geography is mainly private businesses that are, are financing and, and running this. And the old geography is sort of the state-run sector of, uh, where you have these large undertakings uh, where, I mean, the coal are transported through, uh, through railways to, to the power plants in the big cities. But again, as, as a sort of a public, uh, a public undertaking. In Northeast, of course, this, I, mean, I really love this. Uh, this is a mural painting by you uh, outside the town of Margarita, which is again a, a beautiful story about the name of Margarita. But when you're entering the town of Margarita, uh, you, you have this painting, uh, this mural uh, speaking about the, the uh, excavating happiness from the depth of darkness. And, and this is one of the, the, the larger. Uh, Cold fields where you have sort of an open pit mine, a huge mine where you have, you know, I mean, modern uh, tractors and, and whatnot to, to, to dig out the coal. But when we are, the story that I'm looking at here is what is known as uh, uh, sort of artisan coal mining or rat coal mining in the context of uh, Megalaya. And this, the, the most of these mines are, are owned and run by uh, uh, indigenous, uh, I mean, the Kassas and the Yankees and the Garus, who are the main uh, groups, indigenous groups in, in the state. And it's been sort of, it's been largely a sort of an unregulated uh, mining undertaking, where, it, where it's sort of passed under the radar of all the national legislations relating to environmental and protection of laborers has, has not been uh, imposed here as it has been sort of passed as a sort of as a cottage industry which is under the because these areas are under the sixth schedule where the, the indigenous and tribal peoples are supposed to govern themselves so and, and uh, they have all the rights to the land and also to the natural resources of these areas uh, and it's been sort of yes it said it must been under it's been under I mean this has been going on for it's been there is a longer history to it, but in the 90s it really took off in a big way. And it's been uh, criticized by a lot of people uh, because of the environmental hazards, but also for the plight of the laborers. And a lot of the laborers in these mines, you know, it's these horrible conditions. I mean, it, it really, you know, people are crawling into these long tunnels. At first you go down and then you crawl into these long tunnels. And some of the laborers, Further down, it's you know kids under the age of 12 even who are, who are doing this very very dangerous work. So it's being criticised for for because of the labour situation, but also because of the environmental consequences. And that has been debated for some, quite some time, and and um, and eventually then and and this was. Uh, it came again uh, to the fore when this is, there was an accident uh, in December 2018 when 18 or 15 laborers were, were caught and then eventually died uh, in, in one of the, these tunnels. And they, they tried to rescue them, which was a pathetic uh, uh, attempt to, to rescue the laborers. But before that, so in 2014, uh, there was this 
Eventually, the Supreme Court intervened under the National Green Tri Tribunal and put a ban on, on, on rat hole mining in the state. And this was after a, a public interest litigation was, was submitted by a local organization in Assam called the Old Dimasa Student Union. Because uh, then they were complaining about that the water downstream, downstream in the Kopli River was, was contaminated. Uh, and, and, and sort of so, so the, the, the National Green Tribunal then was, was uh, calling a ban or stop on all mining uh, and then was sort of the argument was that you, know, you have to come up with the regulations but also eventually develop new sort of scientific mining methods uh, and until then there was not supposed to be any, any mining, uh, no, no continuation of mining. But one of the problems here was, was that they gave a sort of they allowed people to transport the already mined coal, and that was sort of gave people a, a window to continue actually mining and transporting out coal. Uh, and, and and the thing is that I mean this intervention by, by the by the Supreme Court on this particular bench was, I mean everyone knew that it will eventually happen. So already in my book that came out 2011, uh, in a book called Unruly Hills. Uh, I was talking about that this will actually happen because it was so obvious to anyone that this was not really, I mean, socially or environmentally sustainable. And uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the way it happened was very similar to an earlier intervention by the Supreme Court where they put a ban on, on timber operations, where, you know, there was large-scale deforestation going on and eventually the Supreme Court came in and said, you're not allowed to cut any more trees. And, and the reactions to those, to the ban and timber ban, and now to this ban on coal mining was very similar. So it was people coming up saying that, that this actually is a violation of the sixth schedule where we are supposed to have autonomy. And also, you know, there was a lot of outcries saying that people are now starving because of, of you know, there, there is no more income from, from. How far is this from Jaka? Oh, <laughs> this is central India. It's a very, very different. Uh, then I have to go back to show you the map, and we can come back to that later on. But it's a very different part of this. Your country, of course, Eastern India, and this is uh, Northeast India. So, uh, yeah, so the coal lobby was really, uh, I mean, lobbying. They went to Delhi and was trying to, to, to lift the ban, and there was a lot of, uh, instead of really going into it, so the, the whole political uh, elite in the state was trying to lift this ban uh, rather than to look into it. And, and, and uh, what eventually happened then uh, was that, uh, that, as I said, you know, they, they, they allowed people to transport coal that had already been mined, but that uh, opened up then, so it was large scale. The, the mining actually continued as before. So there was this activist, Agnes Karsin and Amita Sangman, there was a lot of other people also who were, went out to report or to document this illegal then uh, mining and transport of coal and they were surrounded during one of these trips they went out a lot to do that and, and during one of the trips they were attacked by uh, this is not a very nice photograph sorry for that but during one of these uh, trips they, they were surrounded and eventually really badly beaten up and almost killed and left in, in a forest uh, by, by a group of I mean, coal miners and, and, and mine owners this was in November 2018. And, and eventually, you know, they were really, particularly, uh, I mean, they were really badly beaten up, and, and, but miraculously they survived. Uh, and, and I think that really, I mean, a lot of things happen here, sort of converge in, in, this, in this context, and I think here, I, I, I see this event along with some others that I'm coming to that it became sort of a turning point or a rupture or what the Danish ge uh, geographer Christian Lund calls an open moment where opportunities and risk multiply and the scope of outcomes widens and when new structures, structural and architecture is erected. And so the, this became a large outcry and I think it's important to think here, you know, that, that these activists, particularly Agnes Carcine, she's a sort of from a 
quite well-known family in the state. And I think the fact that these coal miners attacked her in such a way, I mean, almost killed them, was became sort of a wake-up call for a lot of people. I mean, the extent to which the coal mafia, that a lot of people talk, talk about the coal mafia, were, were ready to go to, to sort of to quieten the critique. Uh, and, and this also triggered a, a group of, of activists in the state to, to compile these two volumes of uh, what they call the course of unregulated coal mining in Meghalaya, a, a citizen report, which was then submitted to the, to the Green Tribunal. Uh, and along with this, so I think, you know, part of why... Uh, I think also why they were attacked and why, why sort of there was a lot of violence, it was a very tense situation emerging in a way. And I think part of that, this is also not a very good uh, slide, but one of the things that had sort of running up to this was this other bill that was, uh, uh, there was, uh, I can't find the word now, uh, it was a sort of, uh, Controversy around the amendment bill of the Kasi Social Customs of Lineage Act of 1997, 1997 which was adopted in, in 2008, in July, by the Kasi Hill District Council. And the, the thing here with, with the bill, which is sort of, if you can read it there, but, but the most controversial aspect of this amendment to this uh, lineage bill was that if a, a, if a Kasi woman marries a non Kasi, or a non-tribe, they will lose some of the membership in the, in the, in the tribe, but also the, the rights that comes with that. And this really, and, and most of all the rights to own land, because only people, I mean, in these states, within the six scheduled areas, in the hill areas of northeast India, only people that belong to the, to the sort of scheduled tribes in those areas are allowed to own land. And, and so they were also, then, if you marry, and not only you, but also your children, will, will lose the right to hold land in the state. Uh, and this was uh, really created a huge uproar among people, and particularly among young women that felt that they were targeted by the, by the act. And Agnes Kalsing, she was also one of the, one of the most vocal critics, critics of this uh, new amendment bill to, to, to the Lineage Act. And she, she said, for example, and this is from an article in the Hindu, the so-called tribal protectors who have destroyed forest and land through corrupt practices are now targeting women as if their marriage to non-tribals will make the tribal extinct. So several other prominent and lesser known women spoke out against what they saw as a toxic, toxic masculinity, uh, an attempt to curtail the rights and agency of women, not least in their role as custodians of ancestral property. Bearing in mind that castes are following a matrilineal kinship, kinship where property and clan membership are traced from, um, from mothers to daughters. Matrilineal has increasingly been considered a nuance or an irritation to the indigenous elite whose power base is built on resource extraction, above all on coal. Women, as, as mentioned, are in the forefront of the critique against the rootless extra extractivism that dominated in the post-colonial period, where the indigenous elite, under the, under the disguise of ethnic autonomy, been able to take possession of huge tracts of land. So I, it's better to read, otherwise I'll never cover all through this. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, as I said, you know, possession of huge tracts of land, turning these to sites of la large-scale logging and mining. Uh, but the, then having the opposition against the amendment and against the coal mining is a larger struggle against the dominant mode of unsustainable resource extraction in the state that has led to the concentration of wealth, land and political influence in the hands of the indigenous elite. While not directly articulating as an alter alternative program or uh, a political vision, I think it's apt to think this as a form of what Kassan <coughs> Hajj terms alter politics explorations in alternative modes of inhabiting and relating to Earth. Uh, and this is a point that I'm developing in, in, in another paper together with Nathan Wallau, who is also a local schol scholar. When we look at uh, how sort of uh, 
the opposition against this lineage act also goes together with opposition against uh, mining or uh, the sort of extractive uh, modality. Uh, where sort of, uh, and also articulating a sort of alternative imagining building on ongoing relations to and care for ancestral lands passed on by generations of women. It's important to stress here that this is not a matter of urban indigenous intellectuals alone. Those these are certainly critical, but to perhaps, but to perhaps most, yeah, the best example here is from, from the local opposition against uranium mining, which uranium mining is another very controversial thing in, in the state, where one of the, one of the sort of the main figures uh, in the opposition, uh, so this is Ghazan Hajj, uh, alter politics. One of the main uh, figures in, the, in, in, in stopping, blocking the, the uranium <coughs> mining project to go ahead is this uh, uh, old woman uh, named Spiliti Lingdo Lang Langrin. Mrs. Langrin holds the rights to most of the land uh, in the area for the proposed uranium mine. This is a long-standing issue, and, and Mrs. Langring has argued again and again that they do not want uranium to be mined, telling a reporter recently, we belong here, and we won't give up our land till that. And I also met her, uh, this is, I think, 10, 15 years ago, and she was basically saying the same thing then, you know, that I mean, there were some test mining going on in the 90s, and, and you know, that brought a lot of people into the area, and she was saying you know, that there's, there's no more peace here, there's a, a lot of commotion, and we don't want these people here, and we don't want uh, the... And they were talking about all kinds of effects of, because of, of the, the test mining that's been going on. And, and why she's been successful in, in, in blocking, I mean, again, you know, this large uranium deposit sitting here is, is something that you know, the, the Indian state of course wants and at some point they might be, be pushing this issue again but I think they, they got, uh, she got support also from the very powerful CASI student union so, so, so through that larger uh, opposition they've been able to, to block the, the mining to go ahead but this has been really a source of irritation to the, the, the political elite in, in, in Sri Lanka, you know, the, who feel that they want to sort of continue to build development through extraction. Uh, but let me pause here a little bit and, and sort of get back to, to Susani Barua's book in, in, in the name of the nation. And I mean, uh, so as I said, you know, Sanjib is, is a close friend of mine and we've been we sort of debating back and forth for a long time. And in one of the chapters, chapter three in the book, where I mean, he, he also quotes me a lot there, uh, he, he starts off with a quote from anthropologist Anna Singh. Uh, How do ordinary people get involved in destroying their environments, even their own homes, home places? This is a quote from, from her book, Friction. Uh, and he says that this question is, is highly relevant in the context of, of the Meghalaya coal, coal uh, mining. Uh, and here, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I mean, I, I really, this particular chapter, I really sort of share his uh, Sanjib's description of what was going on. You know that coal mining has been really reckless; it's been creating in, in enormous environmental problems. It has led to the formation of indigenous elite that now controls sort of so through the through the coal. The, the, there's a new tribal elite coming to power who really controls the state, who then blocks all kinds of, of, of uh, attempts to to control it until then. The, the National Green Tribunal came in, but again then obstructing that and go continuing with the coal mine. So I really agree with his description, which is also a description that you know, he based on my work. But I think one of the problems then uh, is how he analyzes this, why this happened. And, and this is a quote uh, that from the book, which I think we can sort of think a little bit more about. 
Ironically, the coal ban is widely criticized in Meghalaya on grounds that it has destroyed the livelihoods of indigenous people. The language is stunning. In the standard literature, the rise of capitalist resource frontiers is usually associated with posing a threat to indigenous people's livelihoods. This is because resource frontiers make claims on the resources of the latter subsistence commons, and it eventually unmoors them from the, com from the commons. Yet, according to one reporter, nearly everyone in Meghalaya's coal country was critical of the NGTs, the, the uh, National Green Tribunal's uh, order, and was in favor of coal mining. These were clearly not voices of an indigenous community still moored to its subsistence common. So Sanyib then goes on to, to make a more general claim about the Northeast resource frontier be it about coal, timber, or hydropower, which is one of the, the most contentious issues up in the state of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, enriching the state recognized elites of ethnic tribal communities who enrich themselves through rootless extraction. And why that can be, why that can happen is due to the fact that the colonial pol policy of creating excluded or partly excluded tribal zones in the frontier tracts have survived or been reinvented through, uh, by the post-colonial state under provisions of the sixth schedule and through that you know, the autonomous district councils as well as other arrangements for political participation and land ownership in the hill states. While well, these are exclusively reserved for people that belong to these particular scheduled tribes. While I certainly share his description of the problem with the indigenous elite and the ways through which they manage to enrich themselves through rootless mining and logging, I don't subscribe to his analysis. I mean, there, there, while there are plenty of critiques within the indigenous communities to the function of the autonomous district councils, few people from these communities would, would argue for scrapping these institutions. They would rather you know, see them, if the critics from within would rather see them than in, in that case be replaced for other forms of indigenous governance or self-determination. And however paradoxically it might sound, colonial policies like the inner line regulation of 1873, this is again, I'm dropping these things, we can come back to that later on what it means, but, but for some people, you know, the, these colonial policies are, you know, seems more attractive than some of the, 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 the present ones uh, for a lot of indigenous peoples in Northeast India, as well as in other parts of the world. And this is, uh, um, I mean, despite the fact that these colonial policies was based on ideas that these were people that were too primitive to be part of the larger mainstream, so they have to be kept separate because otherwise they would be swollen up or sort of destroyed by the by modern large scale mainstream society. And this is again something that we see, for example, in the Shittagong Hill tracks, where, where, I mean, during the height of the, the, the genocide in the hill tracks in the 80s and the 90s, what the, the then guerrilla movement, the Shanti Bahini, was actually arguing for, that they wanted to have this 1900 regulation, again, a colonial regulation called the Regulation of 1900, which again was. Uh, placing the hill tracks under a different administrative regime where people from the plains were not allowed to move up there and settle there. Uh, so, but in Sanjib's understanding, such inclusivist arrangements in the course, is the cause of the problem. And as he states for the northeastern case, what is, required is, what is required is instead a politics of citizenship based not on memories of a real or imagined past, but on a vision of a common future for the people who live in the region today. So what Sanjeev ultimately is criticizing here is the idea that certain people are being recognized as indigenous peoples, and as such is bearers of certain exclusive rights to ancestral territories. This is indeed a question that has been with us for the last three decades or so. And I have myself written a lot about this earlier, you know, the idea about, you know, that there are certain people that, be, that call themselves indigenous peoples and as such, you know, should be a right bearers. And this is something that's been sort of debated in anthropology. Is this a, uh, uh, but I think 
I'm sort of my, the position that I'm taking throughout for quite some time now is that this is sort of a more pragmatic position that it's a, apparently a lot of for a lot of people, you know, for a lot of indigenous people, uh, this is something that resonates with their with their history, their experiences, as well as their aspirations. So people are running with this concept. They, they call themselves and claim rights on the on, on, on the basis of being indigenous. And I think this is something we have to recognize rather than, I mean, we pass the state of whether it's a good or bad idea. People are doing it. You know, they, they pursue that type of politics in India, but also, of course, elsewhere. And, and I think with all political movements, there are you know, pros and cons. There are difficult things. But I think this has to be worked out on the ground rather than sort of, you know, you can't put that sort of movement back in a way. It's, it's already out there and people are running with it, as I said. Uh, so I think if the 90s and the 2000s have been about you know, establishing indigenous peoples as sort of collective right bearers, I think what is happening today and wh what I find interesting is, I don't know if I missed some of the slides, yeah, which I find interesting now is sort of a turn inwards, but indigenous governance is more and more about you know, how to live differently and how to live on the land differently. And here I think one of the things I find very interesting is the turn towards indigenous food sovereignty, where uh, plants, seeds, heritage crops, uh, and also cuisines become part of how you build yourself, how you are, you know, how you live as an indigenous person. And, and, and this is... Uh, this is happening really globally, this turn towards sort of, uh, as I said, you know, the, the ideas about food sovereignty. And this is, yes, from I see that this is run by Caritas, but when they start looking at indigenous seeds in the Northeast. And I think here is an example of how the indigenous movement is also aligning with other uh, global movements for, say, the slow food movement or other movements who try to curtail the, the power of the, sort of the, the, the global uh, agro-industry that controls you know, the, our food systems, and particularly the control of seeds is something that is you know, really important to, to think more about. Uh, and here again, I think we can sort of come back to this, uh, to the anti-coal movement in Meghalaya. And I think what they ultimately call for is to build a future beyond extractivism. Uh, but yet building on, the, on safeguarding the specific, right, specific rights of those with, it a, with, with a longer history in the state. And I think it, here also, if you, in the particular context of, of, of Megalaya, it's very interesting to see how the matrilineal idea uh, is also central to this rebuilding. You know, the, the fact that uh, that land is, is following through the, the, the female line. Uh, and, and again, ideas about women being not only owners, but also custodians of land. And I think building on that idea as, an, as, a, as a, a contrast to, uh, to, to the extractivist uh, modality. Yeah, and I think here, uh, you know, coming back to that idea that, uh, that, uh, um, that Anand Singh is talking about in friction, you know, that, that resource front is being sort of uh, not being places where it's not yet settled, you know, they're open, they're wild, and a lot of things, and that also attract a lot of people that are trying to enrich themselves in, in a, uh, I mean, a lot of fantasy about, you know, getting money, in, 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 uh, quick money, you know, and, and I think this is also, I mean, the earlier work that I've mentioned, uh, I mentioned about uh, Dolly Keegan's work, and she's working on coal and oil in the Assam, Nagaland foothills. And here is also, I mean, the, how she presenting that place is uh, uh, extremely violent place. I mean, there is a lot of unclarity about who owns the land. There is a lot of people have fantasies. It talks about carbon fantasies. People are fantasizing about getting rich quickly, and and. And it's also a very masculine space where uh, men are, again, and here it's different from, from the Megalaya case, where, where in, in, in the case of the Nagas, it's a patrilineal society when the men have the land titles. And, and uh, yeah, and, and it's, uh, again, it's uh, extremely destructive 
extraction going on that you know people are you know just shoveling the whole whole mountains are being destroyed and and sometimes people get lucky and they also the, the coal miners talk about you know you have to have luck uh, so it's a matter of luck and some people are striking on a coal uh, seam and and do actually manage to get uh, rich in, in a quite short time yeah And I think again, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I think that, that the Megala case is, is something that really is important to think about because I do think that, as I said, you know, the, the matrilineal uh, principle with, with ownership of land is with the women. This is also, again, as I said, you know, something that it gives women a space of maneuver. And I think this is also what the district council with this you know, lineage bill are trying to curtail, you know, that, that women become sort of a blockage for, for future extraction. Uh, one of the things then, yeah, one of the things again that Dolly and I found in our work with with, uh, with the young indigenous migrants, you know, who are leaving the hills, moving down to the big cities in Bangalore, Mumbai, and, and you know, due to you know skills, English language skills, uh, and also a certain type of sort of habitus been able to get jobs in, you know, in spas, in restaurants, shopping centers. And for a lot of these people, you know, they were, uh, they were really sort of vested with the home community and the ideas about ethnic homelands for their respective community. But they felt that their own lives could not unfold in these spaces. You know, they felt that they, 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 they were looking for a life outside of subsistence, subsistence agriculture. I mean, agriculture, that, that was no longer the future. But they really, so they were looking for a different life, uh, but uh, they still sort of seem to be very attached to, the, to, the, to, the, to their, their home communities and the, and the land back home. Uh, and one of the things that, I mean, we were also struck, that these were really hardworking and, and resourceful persons. And I think one of the things that, uh, that uh, Duncan Matui Ra was writing afterward in the book is pointing to is that you know that the coming ten years might be the, the returns of these young people. And I think this is something that we see as a possibility of sort of renewing the, the Northeastern societies when these sort of young people are getting married and start getting children and perhaps moving back. And I think that's sort of open up a new uh, I think a new 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 possibilities for this region. I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I'm aware that, and I don't know how familiar we, you are with all these terms, but I think we can perhaps come back to some of the things that, 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 uh, that might be more difficult for those of you who are not so familiar with Northeast. Yeah, I guess Thank you for that. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, so the first is on um, how we should look at the labor supply um, in the coal mines, yeah. how that would be impacted by the current politics of the Citizenship Amendment Act and also you know, this call for ILP. Yeah. Uh, because as we know, a lot of the migrant laborers come from Bangladesh, so yeah. how, do, how do those debates sit together? Uh, the other is on, um, you mentioned the KSU being in support of anti-uranium um, movement, of the anti-uranium uh, movement. However, they've not really been very vocal against coal mining. Oh, right. Exactly. So, um, uh, especially, I, I don't know if you've read the news, but today itself there, were, uh, there was a bombing uh, allegedly c c conducted by members of the HNLC, and they have uh, basically bombed... Um, <coughs> uh, uh, this this coal uh, mining site and their articulation is basically uh, not against uh, you know environmental exploitation as such, but it's against the coal mines being owned by non-tribals. So we see that kind of politics yeah. also. You know, it's, it's, it complicates the matter. Uh, the sorry, I have another one, um, which is um, yeah, when we're studying coal mining as you know a phenomenon. 
uh, I think it's also important to, uh, to, to, to study the lifeline of coal as such because it's not enough for us to understand where the coal is coming from, where the extraction is happening, but the, the supply, like where is it, where is the coal from Mikhail going? We, we don't really, uh, you know, know much about um, the, the, you know, about, um, about that. The movement, we know that it goes into Bangladesh, but what kind of companies exist in Bangladesh? We know Lafarge, but you know we don't really know much. This is some kind of a um, you know a, a mythic uh, facade over there. Um, and the last question is on uh, you mentioned the matrilineal um, uh, system being kind of um, you know subversive uh, in terms of land ownership. Uh, but we all know. I mean, you know, I come from the community, and I know that there are many limitations to the matrilineal system, uh, especially in terms of how <coughs> it is custodian. It's, so it's really a symbolic power of the women who own land. It's not really a real, um, you know, legal power that I have as a woman landowner to do whatever I want with my ancestral land. Uh, and also the fact that patriarchy is really at the core of the matrilineal system in Meghalaya and how we. Maybe we have to rethink how matrilineal how, how matrilineal works in uh, you know in, in, in contemporary Mikalia. Sure. Just, yeah. Yeah, this is good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think but well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I personally hope that coal mining will be uh, clo a close chapter in a way. I mean, I think we are, I hope that we are moving to a situation of after coal, but I mean, I don't, I'm not sure whether it will happen because. The idea that you can sort of, I mean, some people who are uh, geologists are saying that you, know, you can't really mine coal in a sort of open pit manner because the seams are very different. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've been able to mine coal through these rat holes because you follow the seams, which is, again, you know, extremely dangerous. I mean, it's horrible work, basically. And some people are hoping that, you know, the idea that you can sort of have modern scientific mining will never happen. So in, in that way, you know, that perhaps you can see it or see your facing up. But, but definitely, I mean, most of the laborers, I mean, few classes, for example, of giantess would you know, do that type of work. So it's mainly Bangladeshis and Nepalese and also some other, you know, people from other parts of or India that are, are doing this type of work. And, I mean, for some people then, again, you know, it's a dangerous work, but it pays, I mean, they are, if you work a whole season, you know, you can still make it good money compared to if you are so, you know, agriculture labor perhaps. So, so yeah, so of course that we complicate the whole thing, but we don't know exactly, I mean, there are still mining going on and transport, and they're finding new ways to get into Bangladesh, there are new roads opening also down to us and so, so it's still going on, but I think at some point, you know, this is becoming a nuance also, I don't know how, they, how long this can go on in that way. And again, if then the sort of scientific methods will not happen, uh, we might see sort of the, the closing down of the, of the cold chapter, I hope. So, uh, I can't remember the magic words, but if I, if I first thing, I mean, there's a lot of debate about, you know, are women empowered in Megalaya, you know, in a matrilineal society? Are the Kasi women in more empowered than, you know, other women in India or South Asia more generally? And you know what is this uh, in terms of you know the, the land ownership? I think it's. I I, I like this case, uh, uh, and she's not the only woman who are actually there who say not my land. This is my land. You know, I'm, I'm deciding here, and I think there is uh, there is a lot of. Actually, there are very few empirical studies that looks at who are actually deciding on land use and ownership. Because what is happening is that with people making money through, before it was timber operations and then after the coal operation, they we did money, they are buying up land. And that becomes what is known as self-acquired property, which is sort of a new category, which then can be given to, you know, if you have sounds, you can hand it over to you can sort of, uh, separate from somehow the, the ancestral property which is supposed to go from mother to daughter. I think there's a lot of debate here and, and, and I mean we, we've been, for this little paper that I did with Nata, um, uh, Nata uh, we were doing some, she was doing some field work in her own family. And her mother, for example, this is a very specific case, but her mother said, this is my land. I can give it to whatever I want. Uh, so I mean, there are a lot of 
to, to think about this, but of course there is a power struggle in the family and there are in the community and then in the lineages. But um, I, I'm not so sure to, I mean, I suppose you know better than me, but to what extent males are actually in, in, in control of them. Because I think I think there are. I mean, it's not to say that that the, the caste women in, in that they are living in a patriarchal situation. But I think the matrilineal principle gives them some uh, room of maneuver. And this is also what the district council, you know, the tribal el elites are trying to get rid of mm -hmm. by saying that if you marry outside, you know, you lose the rights. So I think there's a struggle there, and I think that idea about you know on that principle gives him. Some, 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 uh, yeah. What was the middle thing? I, I, what was the middle question? Um, God. Something about the case you, yeah, the stuff. Yeah, the case you, it's very, very yeah. interesting. You know, the case you, yeah. is, uh, so again, you know, the, the, the student unions in North East are very sort of strange animals, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not sort of a normal student union. In that way, they are engaged in politics, and the KSU are extremely powerful. They, a lot of the political leadership in the state comes from; they have a history of being part of the student unions. And, and I mean, for example, the, the KSU were also uh, taking a stand on logging, so they were in favor of the support on, on, the, on the timber plant. They've been very active in the anti against uranium mining. But coal, again, and I think coal is too important. I mean, coal has been, you know, also the, the insurgent groups have been, you know, mm -hmm. been financing, the, I think they've been taxing the coal industry. So, and I think this also goes from the KSU, I suppose, to get revenue stream coming in. Yeah. So, coal has been too difficult to target. And, and, and this is, again, uh, one, of the, one of the really big problems here. So, so case, you are not really sort of an environmental organization, but they take cases where, where it somehow suits them, you know, and exactly. you don't really know how they will, when they will come out for or against something, which is a very tricky. And most of them are not even students, even though it's called Kasi students yeah. here. But they have a mass space organization that really reach out in the villages mm -hmm. while they have students. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, this question isn't a, really about this particular presentation, but yeah. in your book, Alindy Hills, you mentioned the possibility of using our forests as uh, carbon sinks. Yeah. And I mean, like we talked about the the land rights and how they kind of are integrated in every in every sphere, with mm -hmm. regards to resources and politics and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but then a lot of the communities are just, they're, they're not for state intervention, so how would, and it, you also mentioned in the book about how they oppose the World Bank's resource-led strategy. So how would, um, how would we, in this climate change crisis, how can we address to use the carbon sinks and the forests and address climate change and also address the challenges faced by the indigenous communities and how they're not for the ban, the global ban, and the gold ban. <coughs> yeah, I mean, again, one of the most famous forests, and which I'm also writing about in the book, is this, uh, I mean, the Kasi state also have what they call the sacred forest, a forest where you're not supposed to touch or, or, or and if you do, you know, you would fall ill or, or, or and shall die perhaps. One of the most famous one is Maflan, which is quite not far out from, from the Shilong, which is the sort of the capital of the state. And uh, I don't know if that's in the book, but I think it's in later uh, paper. What, but, you know, there's been a lot of investment, a lot of different uh, development agents have been sort of wanting to invest. In, because again, you know, the idea here is that otherwise conservation is often seen as an anti people who want to conserve, you know, it's a tiger resort. Or, I guess why you know, people are not allowed to enter. But here then, among the classes, you have a sort of indigenous form of conservation, and that's where people jump into that and want to support their efforts to, to preserve this area. And most recently, they've been through these you know, uh, carbon offsets. 
So there are too many parts, so I think also, I, mean, I don't know if you've been following this, but I mean, additional areas. Protected forests. Protected forests under this uh, idea about, you know, that you, you now remember exactly what is normal, but this, I'm about this, but I can't remember exactly. But yeah. you, you keep them as carbon sinks, you know, okay, you, you don't you allow to touch them and for 30 or 20 or 30 years, they have to sit there and then the community are getting some money for that. And I think one of the tricky things with that is that, of course, when you do that, you also somehow hand over the, the management and ownership for these bigger to, to outside people. So I think it's, it's very, it's a, again, very tricky thing. But, yeah, I don't know if you have to answer your question there, but I mean, it, it is, I mean, coming back to, to, to the quote from, you know, that Sami got bringing out from the quote from Anatsim, you know, how is it people are ruining their own environment, you know, their own land? It's a big challenge for people in, 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 in Magdalaya. How do you travel around? You know, because I think that the, the money you can get through logging before and to coal mining is so much compared to what you can get through subsistence agriculture. And of course, and you know, there's not so many jobs in government sector. There's not so much other things. Uh, I mean, so many private things coming up. So it's an extreme attraction. I mean, a lot of people are going there. And, and, and again, it's not sustainable in the long run, so I think something has to come up. And, and, and that's why I find this sort of, as I said, you know, indigenous food sovereignty movements, there is something there which, again, I think that if you think about you know, the, the enormous richness and biodiversity you have in, in, I mean, among the cars and scouts and other indigenous communities in the North, it's just that the varieties of rice you have is enormous. I think that is a potential to rebuild community, I think, to also rebuild the environment. I mean, it sits well as an idea, but we've seen how NESFAS has ruined, uh, you know, the slow food movement. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you've been following how um, it's, it's really, you know, uh, kind of concentrated on the local elites, like all the funding that's coming from the UN. Yeah, 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 so that's, yeah. I think that's a structural yeah. problem, which is the same with the Red um, red Plus uh, Yeah, Red Plus, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Red Plus, because they, they promoted community management of forests, yeah. but then at the, at the end of the day, the people who are really in charge are the people handpicked by the organization yeah, from the US. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, not sure. really the, you know, and, and they also uh, depended on the uh, the traditional uh, Darbar institution, which is like an all male body. Yeah. So, what, what you know, kind I, of. You know, I, I know all this, but I mean, there are things that, you know, things come up and then they get sort of taken over or controlled yeah. in a way. And, yeah. and what is, yeah, so this is a tricky thing, but I. I you're so hopeful. <laughs> but you're looking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, but there are also, I mean, of course, so that with the little food movement, so the food movement, I mean, there, there are also things happening that is not sort of reached, which is just going on. You know, people are cultivating the same things, uh, which I think is something that more and more people are noticing. Yeah. Some guys are just continuing with that, you know, the, uh, the same crops as before. But in that sense, are you looking at that in? as related, for instance, to what Sikkim has done yeah. in terms of organic? Yeah. Are you looking at it as I something so. Different? I mean, this is what we are planning to do into this thing. Now, this is not something that I've done so far. But I mean, again, you know, Sikkim is quite also very interesting. But again, when you're there talking to people, they don't seem to be so. <laughs> I mean, again, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people are critical of what is happening in Sikkim as well. But, but I haven't really looked into it myself. There was a, yeah. uh, thank you. I'm not familiar with this issue at all, and I found it very interesting. Um, I was just curious, who is buying the coal ultimately, and who are the direct benefactors or consumers? Because it is, it would then help balance out autonomy of what's happening there in the region. So with the, a yeah, yeah. So the coal is going to waste. Even down to us, somebody where it's sort of a rain head, and that's also reason. I mean, even if some of the the coal mines are owned and some of the trucks are owned by uh, local people. 
most of the money still goes to, uh, there is different middlemen coming all the way. So when it reaches down to its sort of a coal deposits in Assam and then loaded onto trains and then sold elsewhere in India. I think most of it is used for industrial coal, different industrial uses. this. So it's either go that way or it goes down to Bangladesh. I mean, Bangladesh is used also in, in, in the cement industry, but also for other. I think mean, this also depends on the different qualities of coal, and I think this is supposedly a high sulfur. Um, uh, it's not so high quality as I understand, but it's used in different, for different industrial purposes. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, just because you, you talked a bit about that there's a kind of global indigenous solidarity movement around mm -hmm. food and that kind of stuff. Um, I wondered if you'd observed any kind of wider kind of pan Indian kind of indigenous solidarity movement, I guess with people under the fifth schedule, um, in the sense that you have kind of a, a wider pan Dalit movement. Or even really like a pan North Eastern. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea about, I, I'm just following it in some other papers, but I mean, the, the first time it was sort of used in the 90s, a different uh, organization in the Northeast, and start going to the UN and sort of saying that we are also indigenous people, we have the same situation as some other ways of other regions in Australia and, uh, and other indigenous communities. And, and, and so the start was, and then eventually, also, some of the other organizations from Central India was also taking part in this attempts to sort of uh, get a South Asia participation in these international forums where, where the whole you know, the idea about indigenous people and the rights you know, the, and, and UN was a very critical platform for that type of organization. And uh, I think eventually what they worked out among the Indian organizations that they participated was that let us start with, with saying that the indigenous people of India is close to the already scheduled you know, by the state. So you have the scheduled tribes, and then still recognizing there are some communities that are not scheduled tribes, but you know, would otherwise also be recognized as indigenous. Uh, so I think that was sort of the start, starting point. Mm -hmm. I think that's been, and, and um, that has been going on, and then I think nowadays, so they hardly have different sort of regional, so you have Northeast India, you have uh, regional conferences, so they are working out things in there also in South India and then Central India. And I think by now it's quite established that the idea about indigenous peoples has been quite established. Though of course uh, the Indian government has never recognized in you know, so They are all either you know, the position of the Indian government has all to be that either they are all indigenous, you know, and the Hindus of course, uh, or <laughs> no one is indigenous in India. So so they are saying that you are in favor of indigenous people's rights, but it doesn't apply to any actually usually the position of the Indian government. Uh, yes, it's been very tricky. A lot of people have been criticizing I've been having this argument with Al Shah, who is at LSE, and she's been sort of writing arguing about the bizarre side of, of uh, indigeneity. But I just saw her, I just bought a new book about the night march, and she's actually but she's using indigenous people <laughs> now in that book. But yes, the fact that you are using the term indigenous people is also somewhat critical. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, in Central India case, you know, a lot of people say that Adivasis are indigenous people, and Adivasis is more the term that's used. In Northeast, people don't usually use the term Adivasi because it could refer to people who came mainly as interior from them, of course. So they would say either tribal or indigenous peoples. But I mean, this is a, a, this is a, a very tricky thing. I think it's that moment of whether there are anyone that are indigenous in India is so past, you know, people mm -hmm. are using it now. It's quite established. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that word? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's I think there is a greater consciousness uh, to, to, to deploy that term mm -hmm. specifically for political reasons and uh, especially in light of you know the citizenship amendment act yeah. um yeah for sure and also like in, in terms of you know the, the historical militarization of the northeast mm -hmm.
another question? Maybe the room is too cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, if not, then we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh.